Don't worry, I haven't abandoned Ocarina of Time. It's just that people have been telling me they want to see me continue discussing stories. So coupled with the fact that it's going to be a ridiculously long video as it is, I need a little more time to fully sort that beast out. The thing is, I was dying to get content up again soon and this right here was a relatively fast and simple game to do. I suppose I really gotta stop teasing and telling people about the next review. It usually just ends up biting me in the bottom. Anyway, in the late 80s and early 90s, beat'em up games were quite popular in both the arcades and the home console market. Good examples would include Double Dragon for the Nintendo Entertainment System and Golden Axe for the Sega Mega Drive. I'm pretty sure many gamers who grew up back then or folks from later generations that are interested in old school stuff have played or at the very least heard of these titles. When the 1989 arcade hit Final Fight by Capcom was ported to the Super Nintendo Entertainment System in 1990, Sega was tasked to develop a brand new IP that could compete directly. True, the company already had arcade ports of the likes of Alien Storm and the aforementioned Golden Axe, but these names didn't generate the amount of interest for the Mega Drive that Sega had hoped for. Developed internally by a division within Sega known as AM7, Streets of Rage came out in 1991 and served as their desired answer to Nintendo and Capcom with Final Fight. Even though I myself wasn't born yet at the time and had my research about the critical and financial response to Streets of Rage turn up rather fruitless, I'm going to assume the game performed well considering two sequels were released in the following years. I've mentioned before that I grew up playing the Mega Drive and the original PlayStation as a kid. However, my actual first exposure to this series doesn't go that far back, to 2009 to be precise, with the Ultimate Sega Mega Drive collection on PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360. Initially set out solely to acquire a Platinum Trophy, the Streets of Rage titles are something I ended up genuinely enjoying on this big retro package, and ever since then, they've become some of my favorite experiences on Sega 16-bit console, and most played beat-em-ups in general. Given that, I figured, why not review this trilogy? It's fairly well known, but at the same time, I wouldn't be too surprised if many of you who are watching right now haven't got a clue about it. Regardless, it would only make sense to start where it all began. What was once a peaceful city has recently been taken over by a secret criminal organization, one that has even managed to control the government and police forces. Incentives by three young cops, Adam Hunter, Axel Stone and Blaze Fielding to put an end to the chaos have continued to be refused by their superiors, most of whom had been bought out or were too afraid to fight back. No longer being able to stand seeing their city becoming an absolute hellhole, the game protagonist trio has left no other option than to leave the team and risk their very own lives in the search for the leader of the syndicate. It's basic and about what you'd come to expect from this genre and time period, but I also have to say that this plot somewhat stands out to me. The majority of games that then embodied the fictional evil shit wants to destroy the world, stop him, or girlfriend has been captured, rescue her concepts. And while it's not any different from the former in Streets of Rage, its underlying tone and sense of realism isn't something you came across very often. Not that it really matters to me. When I'm playing a game like this one, all I need to know is that I'll be crippling heaps of enemy faces, which pretty much sums up the gameplay here in a few words. That said, quickies don't cut it, so let's get down to business, shall we? Like virtually every other side-scrolling beat-em-up title I know of, Streets of Rage is played on a 2D field where you can walk left and right, but also move in and out of the screen, must defeat all the foes present to advance, as I've stated, and ultimately duke it out with the boss at the end of the stage. In terms of moves, there isn't a whole lot to toy around with, but still a decent amount available to you. Basic punch streaks and finishers can be performed by pressing the attack button, and walking up to opponents leaves you with the option to kick them in the knackers or honeypots, fling them across the screen, or slam their skulls into the ground depending on the direction held on the D-pad. As a bonus with the two ladder cases, surrounding enemies or scenery may be damaged in the process as well with careful 
careful timing and positioning. Furthermore, players can jump, helpful in situations where they want to avoid certain attacks such as whipping and sliding, and by pressing the attack button while airborne, a jump kick can be done, which gives your attacks more height and thus makes you harder to hit. The downside to the kick is the small recovery time after landing though. Additionally, every time you press the jump button whilst holding down the attack button, a back attack activates the gift sneakers approaching from behind, a delightful tap on the nose. Lastly, unique to Streets of Rage is being able to take advantage of situations where you're held captive by a mook and if you react swiftly enough, you can land on your two feet after getting tossed. All in all, I'd say most of the techniques here are different enough from each other to come in handy under different circumstances. Mastery of how and when to use any of the given commands is definitely going to get you further than button mashing to the moon and back. Mechanically, the controls are responsive, movement is fluid and the hit detection is mostly solid. However, it should speak for itself that the three cops all handle a bit differently as indicated by the rankings on the selection screen. Adam is the slowest of the bunch by far but deals the most amount of damage and has sick jumping capabilities. Axel is the middleman who has decent ground speed and decent attack power but a poor jump and Blaze is the quickest on her feet with a nice jump but her lack of ripped steroid muscles makes her physically the weakest. When it comes to moves, there are a few tiny nuances to be noticed between the three. From what I could tell, they mostly perform their back attacks in substantially unique fashions, which has a small effect on the way your button presses are timed when finding a couple of the bosses. Needless to say, that's about it, but combined with the varied attributes of each of the three protagonists, you are likely to develop a favorite that suits your playstyle best. For me, that would be Blade. For one, she's a chick, automatically meaning she reigns supreme over the other two characters, and I can beat the game on the hardest difficulty as her without using a single continue. The odds of me doing that as Adam or Axel are lower than this channel ever growing popular, yet none of them require the practicing of new skills or the knowledge on new movesets. This sadly makes for less depth to the overall gameplay, but hey. At least if you're doing co-op with somebody else and your favorite guy or gal is already chosen, you won't have to tear them to shreds. Besides their innate hand-to-hand -hand combat abilities, our heroes can also use a small selection of weapons to dish out the pain. I'm glad to say the balancing on them is generally just fine. Lead pipes and baseball bats have great range and deal more damage than you yourself do, but the catch is that there is a delay in swinging them, giving your own punches and kicks an advantage in terms of speed. Knives sport the same delay and reach noticeably less far, but again deal more damage and can be thrown across the screen too. It's really just the brown bottles that I dislike having on me. The glass shatters after one connected hit, locking you up with the pathetically useless short range piece of garbage. This one accentuates, more so than the other items, the problem of not being able to drop weapons at will. You'll have to take a smack in order to drop them on the ground. It's also annoying when you want to attack opponents but are standing right on top of two weapons as it will cause your character to pick and drop said weapon in a vicious cycle and leave him or her open to get ambushed. When all else fails though, you can call for support by pressing the A button. This sends in the police car driven by another random loyal X agent that fires a rocket launcher. Once the projectile lands, all the regular foes currently on screen are knocked out instantly while bosses will have to say goodbye to a chunk of their health. Oh. I'll be straight up in saying that I find this firework stuff a very questionable inclusion. It's neat and all for cleaning up when you're getting overwhelmed by large groups intimidating you from every conceivable angle, it just kind of raised boss fights. Granted, you do only get one car on storage per life, but to me, it's a method that is easily abused to get through without actually even touching the boss at all. Some might view this special as a great inclusion exactly for that reason, to minimize the soul crushing event of losing a big pile of lives and continues on one douchebag who keeps whooping your butt even after it's turned red. That's a legit point, however, the final stage is sort of like a boss rush stage and it doesn't allow for the police car. I appreciate the fact that developers wanted to make the last stage legitimately challenging, but it's as if though a brick wall has materialized in front of your face out of thin air if you've been relying on your specials before and didn't learn how to properly battle some 
some of the bosses. As far as I'm concerned, changing the rules of the game in this manner is bad design. Speaking of bosses, I think they are one of the weaker aspects of Streets of Rage. This begins with them spawning from the side of the screen, possibly making for fantastic blindsiding if you're close to that area. The worst example being this wrestler that charges towards you and uppercuts you with virtually no time to react, and the fights themselves afterwards aren't anything to write home about either. Most of these fuckers just dance around you and trying to get in front of them usually results in a quick, unpredictable and brutal beating for ya. Folks who've played the game can probably relate to my despise for the Green Blaze clones, who persist in jumping all over the darn place and flipping out of the way of any of your attempts to attack, on top of them tossing you around and suplexing you as much as they can. Getting owned by bosses here frequently has that grating and unfair bitterness to it if you get what I mean, and they hold zero shame in assaulting you with the same exact attack again and again. What solidifies my not so positive view on them is how exploitable they are underneath their razor sharp claws and big burger bellies. It varies a bit between the encounters but there are always certain cheap tricks they keep falling for over and over until they let out their dying screams. <laughs> Even those agile ladies I ragged on mere moments ago represent but a fart in the wind as soon as you discover the majesty of well-timed back attacks. The game does sometimes make an effort to tackle this issue by putting in an extra regular punk to put you off, but frankly, I found them to be hindrances at most. Perhaps I'm being a bit harsh, the bosses aren't entirely terrible and they can still make for tense experiences, but those instances where I got bodied and decided to resort to spamming the fiery rainfall of death or taking on the role of a dirty fighter were too abundant to treat lightly. The AI programming on the whole has room for improvement, to be honest. It requires next to no effort to stun lock foes in place or grapple onto them repeatedly and kick their lights out that way. It's tougher when it's crowded with multiple dudes and dudettes, but even then, there are a couple of nifty workarounds to continue exploiting the system with practice and a thumb that can survive rubbing back and forth on the D-pad. From time to time, the enemies also act like scared babies. It's not uncommon for them to chill outside the borders of the screen and come back when they feel like it, and many of them have a tendency to straight up run away from you, both of which are irks and pace breakers I might add, especially when playing Adam the Snail. On the bright side of it, Streets of Rage isn't a walk in the park, thankfully. Mooks generally won't hesitate too long to assault you whenever they see a good opportunity to, and if you aren't skilled at beat em ups, chances are you're going to get sandwiched in the harder sections. However, assuming you're aware of and have exercised all your executable moves before, 8 to 9 times out of 10 it feels as if foes are simply getting the better of you whenever you fall victim to the ongoing violence. Except for those Akuya bastards. They can rob you of a life in the blink of an eye later on. Apart from him, the rest of the Syndicate's minions aren't that much to get worked up over. Noras like playing SM games with their whips and cannot be damaged when they're resting on the ground because apparently women should always be respected regardless of their acts. Jacks are clowns that juggle hatchets and torches which they tend to send in your direction if you're in their line of fire. And Y signals, what the fuck kind of name is that, are punks with some mad skills in sliding into you and throwing you around. At the bottom of the barrel, we've got the Garcias, who are brawlers just like Axel, Adam and Blaze. These are the easiest to dispatch by a landslide, though I hate the ones dicking around with a knife with the burning passion. Just look at this smug prick. Ugh. Come to think of it, the diversity here is somewhat disappointing. It's literally five different enemy types repeated throughout the course of eight stages. Yeah, mixing and matching them in a plethora of different combinations helps keeping the journey a tad more fresh, but Streets of Rage certainly could have stood to boast a wider array of opponents. I have to add as well that I see missed potential in the level design. More often than not, you'll find yourself walking straight lines with nothing in the way of stage hazards. Stage 6 and stage Stage 7 are the only exceptions with no thwarty gimmicks. The former is a factory with crushers you gotta avoid and can try to lurk bad guys under. And the latter takes place on an ascending elevator, making for incredibly satisfying scenarios where you sent everyone on a flying tour to the streets far below. It's unpleasant you can meet the same fate as well and immediately lose a life from it. Yeah, I 
Could have done without that. In all seriousness, considering the unimpressive enemy variety and the sort of repetitive nature of the genre in the first place, I don't think it would have hurt for the stages to set themselves apart from each other more with new challenges and obstacles. I realize this is a very subjective complaint. Other people may argue that they would distract too much from the core gameplay of beat-em-ups, so don't take my observations on this as a flaw with the game per se. Nevertheless, Streets of Rage isn't exactly a title with long-lasting appeal, I feel in part, thanks to the lack of diversity and everything, including those stages. One playthrough is around an hour long, give or take, and after that you're gonna have to find replay value in the four difficulty settings, maybe the three characters, and racking up high scores if you're a real hipster like me. As for the difficulty levels, there's easy, normal, hard, and hardest, and from my experience, what mostly changes as you move up is an increase in both defenses and offenses on the end of all your opponents. Be my guest to correct me if I'm wrong, but the quantity of moves appears to rev up as well, and I think their AI becomes more aggressive. Health replenishers, a la apples and roast chickens, found by busting crates or sets of tires and such, restore an identical amount of health though. If you can get a second player in for the ride, then that's where this game starts to shine to a bigger degree. The majority of issues in single player, pester the adventure in multiplayer as well, but practically a written rule for 2D action games is that they're best enjoyed with a friend or family member due to the dynamic of having somebody with you. Whether you two are in a serious team effort, strategically planning out minor tactics and backing each other up in the case of an emergency, or hold a rivalry masked behind the co-op label, snatching all the one-ups and food inside away, and screwing the other over under the ideal conditions, it's very likely to keep your mind more active when participating on these streets filled with rage. From a design standpoint, I am unsure if two-player mode messes with the number of foes you'll have to tackle and their AI, but weapon and energy pickups do show up more regularly and whenever you reach a boss, you're going to see double vision. This would pan out well enough, but bear in mind that both players can summon the police guy. If I was undecided about the addition for single player, I totally wouldn't be for co-op, at least not with this execution. It literally removes any ounce of challenge because the penalty of losing lives is exponentially less strong. The coolest feature about multiplayer in my books is the ability to unlock a hidden ending in the final stage. Before Mr gets his massive torso out of his chair, he asks you if you would like to become his right-hand man. Assuming one player accepts the offer and the other refuses it, a fight is initiated that forces the two to try and outright kill their mate. Whomever comes out victorious and successfully puts the criminal mastermind himself to rest afterwards gets to witness their character in the chair, supposedly having turned to the dark side and ruling over the city now. I personally don't find it as fulfilling as the true good ending, but the novelty of the bad ending and the fact it's not super obvious to unlock makes it pretty cool. Now, you would expect another alternate ending if both players say yes to joining Mr. X, or if you're going solo and say yes for that matter, but all that does is boot your power hungry ego slash egos back to stage 6. Fuck. Is that Sega's way of teaching gamers morales or something? What a cruel punishment, and as far as I'm aware, nothing's even changed with regards to obstacles, enemies, basically the challenge as a whole. You know, outside the actual gameplay itself, I'd like to think Streets of Rage would have benefited from more diverse aesthetics. On average, stages tend to hover around the 5 minute mark, and all the while you'll be looking at the same background that scrolls along, occasionally even repeated on loop if need be. Sometimes the environments are lifeless too, with dull color schemes, and even though that fits the vibes of the game, it becomes kinda boring after looking at the same thing for minutes without a shift in scenery in between. Fortunately, a seizable portion of the levels do have pretty appealing themes, from a beach with palm trees and buildings in the distance, to a bridge devoid of vehicles before the backdrop of a lit city, all mostly with some decent visual flair. Think of flashy billboards, newspapers and posters blowing in the wind, or a boat moving up and down 
down on the sea. Nice little details I wish the game had more of, but I'm glad there's some of it at the minimum. The character sprites, despite their small size, look pretty charming and mildly detailed, but the animations are lackluster and the engine is locked at 30 frames per second on top of that. All around, Streets of Rage is an okay looking game, but it doesn't push the graphical hardware in the slightest. And in the very same year, the Mega Drive saw the release of Sonic the Hedgehog, Quackshot starring Donald Duck, and Road Rash, all more visually advanced. I'm starting to rationalize a lot of the budget for presentation here went into the music, because if there's one element about Streets of Rage that's fantastic, it is the soundtrack, and how could it not be? It's written by Yuzo Koshiro, one of the most respected composers in the industry. If you don't know who he is, look him up on Wikipedia and there is sure to be one game, if not a bunch of games listed, where you've heard his work in. That being said, the scores for Streets of Rage 1 and 2 are some of his most popular and most acclaimed achievements. The influence of many electronic dance genres here ultimately led to tunes that are full of tight beats, 90s timber and percussion sounds and thick bass lines. The FM and sample quality is outstanding for Mega Drive standards, thanks to Koshiro's heavily customized audio programming language. A while not all the songs are super melodic, the majority of them remain very memorable. This soundtrack holds up stupidly well for a 1991 video game and the fact there have been numerous official albums is a testament to that. Most importantly, these musical pieces enrich the gameplay experience in the best way possible and it wouldn't be an exaggeration to claim they are the highlight of Streets of Rage, period. Streets of Rage is a classic amongst retro games and its debut sparked plenty debates between the Sega camp and the Nintendo camp with Final Fight on their side. It's a title I have completed by myself and with others more than I can count on four or five hands and I still get a legitimate kick out of replaying it to this day. Be that as it may, reviewing it like this has made me come to the conclusion that it's a rocky first attempt. I would say there is sufficient amount of depth to the mechanics, but the lack of overall variety makes the game sort of bland and monotonous. Moreover, it packs some periodically exploitable, tedious and frustrating patterns for mooks and bosses, and unremarkable graphics for the year of release. Calling Streets of Rage a bad beat-em-up is a stretch. It's an entertaining little romp for what it is in my opinion, one that's aged hella better than the fondly remembered Golden Axe, but I I have a feeling it loses steam for many newcomers after the first playthrough. Only those who are fond of arcade styled experiences are gonna want to revisit on higher difficulties and experiment with the three similar protagonists. The co-op feature can form a breath of fresh air when necessary and the soundtrack alone is worth the price of admission. But if you could play only one installment in the Streets of Rage trilogy, the original is certainly not what I would suggest. <laughs> 